In the last couple lectures of differential equations and linear algebra, we've been looking at some theoretical ideas like the existence and uniqueness theorem for differential equations. Here in this lecture, lecture 9, we're going to get more focused on examples, especially with lecture 9a. We're going to look at a lot of examples of what are called phase lines, which I introduced at the end of lecture 8a. And I want to also introduce you to the very important and interesting idea of a bifurcation, one of my favorite topics, actually. Lecture 9b, we're going to look at dot products of vectors, norms of vectors, angles between vectors, cross products of vectors, and equations in three space, which again sounds like a lot of things to fit into that, but it will all go together pretty nicely, I think. So let's look at examples of phase lines to start off with. This first example is the same example as the, at the end of lecture 8a. We're going to look at a quadratic right-hand side function. All of these examples are autonomous differential equation where the right-hand side function is f of y. It only depends on y, the dependent variable, rather than t at all. That's where we can make phase lines. So, as I mentioned last time, recall that the slope field in an autonomous ODE, dy dt equals f of y, has constant slopes along any horizontal line. And we talked about y last time. I wanted you to think about it. That's because the right-hand side of function only depends on y. And when you make the slope field in the ty plane, when you're looking at a horizontal line here, that's at a constant value of y. Plug in any point along such a horizontal line into the right-hand side function, you'll get a constant value. And that constant value would be the same as the slope of the little mini tangent lines that you make. That's why it's constant along horizontal lines. This means the slope field contains a lot of redundant information. For any given y, all those lines have the same slope. Solution curves would have to be increasing when they pass through this horizontal line. We can therefore compress all that information onto the vertical y-axis um, to give us this idea of a phase line and to understand what's going on with solution curves in a very quick picture that you can make. Here's our example from last time. dy dt equals f of y equals 3y minus y squared, which can be factored and is good to factor as y times 3 minus y. When you look at this kind of right-hand side function, right away you should think, hey, well, that's autonomous for one thing, and for a second thing, I can pretty quickly find equilibrium solutions by setting this equal to zero and solving for y. And you'd see that there are two of them, y equals zero and y equals three. Now in the slope field, those are gonna be horizontal lines that are constant function solutions of the differential equation. And on the phase line, they're gonna to correspond to what we call equilibrium points, dots that don't move, so to speak. Let's get into details. Here is the slope field. Now I have the computer Mathematica draw this for me, but we could make a quick sketch by hand, and you should be able to make a quick sketch, sketch by hand. How? By drawing the graph of this right-hand side function in a separate picture where y is the horizontal axis and the vertical axis is, well, you could label it f of y. You could also label it y prime or dy dt for the vertical axis. This picture is not going to be a graph of a slope field. It's not going to be a graph of any solutions. It helps you understand the slope field or draw it from scratch if you need to. This function is going to be a parabola. Its graph is going to be a parabola opening downward because the coefficient of y squared is negative and have y-intercepts in this picture at 0 and 3. It's going to look like this, upside down parabola. It's positive when y is between 0 and 3. Positive outputs for this function. That means the slope field here, with y vertical, has positive slopes when y is between 0 and 3, between here and here. That's where you see the positive slopes. And in fact, the slopes are maximized at y equals 1.5. Well, that's, where, that's where this function is maximized at y equals 1.5. That's where the slopes are biggest, where you have an inflection point for solution curves. And again, all solution curves here are horizontal translations of each other <clears throat> in this kind of situation. What about when y is bigger than 3? It's hard to see the 3 here now. This is supposed to be a, a 3. When y is bigger than 3, this function has negative outputs now. So y prime dy dt of solutions, the derivative of solutions have to be negative. They have to have negative slopes. And the slopes do get closer to zero, the closer y gets to three, so you see concave up solution graphs here, decreasing in concave up. Y equals three is a root of f. 
that corresponds to an equilibrium solution of the differential equation. Y equals zero is another e um, root of f that corresponds to another equilibrium solution. And when y is negative, values of this function are negative, so solutions once again have negative slopes. But in this case, they're concave down because as they keep decreasing, y becomes more and more negative, and therefore this graph, y prime, is getting more and more negative. Now draw the slope field, or the um, phase line from this. Compress all this information onto the y-axis. Just draw a vertical line. Draw two dots at the equilibrium solutions, y equals 0 and y equals 3. And draw arrows in these three different intervals indicating what direction solutions flow, you might say. Downward when y is greater than 3 because solutions are decreasing. Upward when y is between 0 and 3 because solutions in there are increasing. And downward again when solutions, when uh, y is less than 0 because solutions are decreasing. There. Okay? Because of this nature and because of the way you're imagining it, it's like water flowing along this line, so to speak. When arrows point directly toward an equilibrium point, when y is nearby the point at least, we call such a point a sink. It's like water going down the sink. Now, don't take that analogy too far. It's not that the um, points ever actually reach 3. Just like, because of uniqueness, these solution curves are asymptotic to 3, but they don't ever actually reach it. They don't ever actually touch that horizontal line. So don't take the analogy of a sink too far is what I'm trying to say. When you've got an equilibrium point where nearby solutions move away, that's called the source. It's like water flowing out of something and away. Are, the old, are those the only two things that can happen? No. In higher dimension, dimensions, kind of crazy things can happen. And if you look back at lectures one, two, three, and four or so of this course, we looked at when crazier kinds of things that could happen, like for example with, double, with a double pendulum. Um, but even in one dimension, there is one other kind of behavior that can happen. It's called a node, when maybe below the point, solutions increase toward the point, and above the point, they go away. That's called a node. That can happen as well. Okay, but it's a real big point that I want to make here, that you want to be able to use these graphs over here to help you draw the slope field and help you draw phase lines. And in fact, after example two, we're going to just jump right from this graph to the phase line, and we're going to skip the slope field. But you should always remember that the slope field is in the background. We just aren't drawing it all the time. Here's our example two. Now we have a cubic right-hand side function. I made it something easy to factor. In general, cubics are hard to factor. But I purposely picked the factorization first so that I know the equilibrium solutions and equilibrium points to be 0, 2, and 4. And then I expanded it out. If, if I had given you this instead, Technically speaking, it's an even easy enough situation. You should be able to factor it. There's no constant term, so there's a, a y that can be factored out like this. And with what's left over, you can factor, factor um, as y minus 2 times y minus 4. <coughs> excuse me. So there are two equilibrium, uh, three equilibrium solutions, excuse me, 0, 2, and 4. Um, and that on the phase line is going to correspond to three equilibrium points at 0, 2, and 4. So let's think of this as a step-by-step -step process. The first step in trying to draw the phase line, that's our goal here, is to graph the right-hand side function. You should do that. This is a step-by-step -step process for you. Graph this function, f of y equals y times y minus 2 times y minus 4, in a graph where y is the horizontal axis and y prime equals f of y is the vertical axis, label. You're going to have three roots at 0, 2, and 4. It's a cubic with a, a highest power that's got a positive coefficient. Right away in your mind's eye, you should imagine this kind of thing for the graph. Make sure it goes to the right points. Maybe you want to plot a few points. Here's the kind of graph you should get. That's a graph of this cubic here. Again, roots at 0, 2, and 4. Positive coefficient of y cubed means it does increase at first, then decrease, then increase again. We know it will decrease somewhere because of the fact that we've got three real roots. So that's the first thing to do. Where is it zero? Where is it positive? Where is it negative? It's zero at y equals zero, two, and four. It's positive when y is between zero and two, and when y is bigger than four. It's negative when y is less than zero, or when y is between two and four. Step two 
is to draw the phase line. Okay, for my students, that's you just go ahead and draw the phase line in section 1.6. You don't need to bother drawing the slope field and solution curves, though you could if you want to. And again, it's good to remember it's there. Identify the equilibria. That's plural of equilibrium point or equilibria is plural of equilibrium, but sometimes I'll call it call them equilibrium points. As sinks, sources, or again, this idea of a node that is neither a sink nor a source. It's a sink in one direction and a source in another direction. I'm, in this example, going to also draw the slope field. I'm going to have Mathematica do it, and I put it in this PowerPoint here. Just again as a reminder that it, it is there. We are thinking about solutions of differential equation. The equation's time is involved, and in fact, we're about to go to the Mathematica as well, and I want to remind you there that time is involved. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to draw the slope field and the solution curves. Here is the slope field. Three equilibrium solution, constant function solutions, 0, 2, and 4. Remember the labeling, T and Y. That's what you label the axes for the slope field and solution curves. Thinking about where this is positive and negative. Again, it's positive between 0 and 2, and when Y is bigger than 4. So slopes of solutions are positive between 0 and 2, and when Y is bigger than 4, those solutions are increasing. This graph is negative when y is negative or when y is between 2 and 4. Down here, solutions are decreasing, and in here, solutions are decreasing. And we can then draw the phase line. Three equilibrium points, 0, 2, and 4. 0 is a source, 2 is a sink, and 4 is a source. They're oscillating back and forth between sinks and sources. That is typical of what happens when you have more than one equilibrium point though it's not a guarantee because, again, you can have some nodes in there sometimes. So you've got to watch out for that kind of thing. Okay? There's more examples to look at, but I do want to take some time to look at the Mathematica. With my students, I'm giving them um, more time to work on Mathematica. Um, in these lectures, for the sake of time, I don't have a ton of time to go slowly through what I show you. I do put these things on a Google Drive, and you can download them if you want and experiment with them. I'm not going to take the time to retype things unless it's necessary. So the first thing you want to do, this was, for example, one, the quadratic, is define the right-hand side function, square brackets for inputs. When you first define this, the function, make an underscore, use a colon equals. Semicolon doesn't do anything except suppress the output, but that's not really needed here. D solve value will solve a generic initial value problem if I like, and I, I don't have to solve a generic one, but I'd like to do that, where I let it be an arbitrary initial condition here. I could pick a specific number if I like, but this will solve it in general, which is kind of nice. It gives you a little warning, but uh, this one does work. We are going to see in some of the other examples that D solve value doesn't work as well as you might hope, and that's because the differential equations are just getting more complicated. We can define this function as being our unique solution of the generic IVP. Think of y0 as fixed. Think of t as the variable. And you can enter it like this. I made the y0 subscript. I do need to put underscores for both the y0 and the t because Mathematica doesn't know that y0 is fixed. Mathematica doesn't know that you're thinking of it that way. And I do want to allow Mathematica to change y0. I can plot the slope field along with some solutions. Show combines different graphic objects like a vector plot, which makes the slope field right here. Uh, plot will graph these solutions where the initial condition is 1.5, 0, and 3. I pick those subscripts and make them red with certain thicknesses. Um, this is going to plot the initial uh, value problem with y0 equals 3.5. And I did it in a separate plot because this one has a vertical asymptote. And based on some experimentation, I found it to be close to negative 0.648. Same kind of thing with this one. So I needed to change the T range. Right here, that's the plot. And then all this stuff, the plot range, axis style and stuff, all this just makes it pretty. And we get this kind of picture which we saw in the PowerPoint. Uh, you can make the phase line. I didn't talk about this last time, but basically we're using what's called the graphics command. And a bunch of stuff, including something called infinite line, which makes a line that goes on forever. Arrows make arrows. Um, I can put text in there to make, for example, label things with, as a sink, for example, here. Point makes dots, and I can make the points bigger or smaller with point size. 
Various kinds of things you can experiment with. Mathematica is good to just experiment with based on examples to see what it does. Sometimes you make errors, but you just keep going at it, keep trying, don't worry if you make an error. So that's the E, the phase line. Grid will put both of these together in a grid or a matrix, you might say, of graphs. Puts both of these graphs together. And then, like I mentioned last time, it is a good idea to animate phase lines, at least in your mind. And here I'm literally doing that with Mathematica with a command called manipulate, where I've got an animation parameter, which is t here, that's representing time. I'm letting it go from negative 0.64 to positive 0.64 because it's going to help avoid uh, errors happening from vertical asymptotes being uh, reached. And yeah, I'll let this play, and we see not only a point moving along the solution curve as time increases, but also points on the phase lines moving. As I said in Lecture 8a, only the red dots are equilibrium points. The green dots are not equilibrium points. And in fact, when you make the phase lines by hand, don't draw the green dots. Don't draw any dots except for the equilibrium points. The green dots are representing y-coordinates of solution curves at various moments in time. And you imagine them moving. They move toward the sink and they move away from the source. Maybe I should have made them blue to make you think of water or something like that. Okay? Purposely made them a little smaller than the equilibrium points to emphasize that they're not equilibrium points. That's the kind of thing you want to imagine and not necessarily always literally make an animation for. What about example two? Well, let me just point out that in this example, D solve value produces something kind of nasty looking. Yikes. That's because the differential equation is more complicated. And I experimented with this. I just went ahead and copied and pasted this whole thing. I experimented with, a bit, with it a bit. And without showing you, I, I found that this formula only seems to work correctly when y0 is bigger than 2 as far as giving you graphs of solutions. It will, it will plot when y0 is less than 2, but it doesn't plot as a solution as you might want. So when y0 is less than 2, I decided to turn to what's called a numerical ODE solver, nd solve value instead of d solve value, um, to find, to approximate solutions for those initial conditions. The syntax is pretty similar as d solve value, uh, not exactly the same. And you should realize that when you enter it, it's not giving you a formula. <laughs> it's giving you a graph, essentially, a numerical approximation, data points like we get with Euler's method that are connected with some sort of interpolation scheme. It even says interpolating function. Somehow I've stored the output of this in a variable I've called phi y0 equals 1. Why did I call it that? Well, because of y0 equals 1 right there. It's the initial value problem where y of 0 equals 1. I also did it where y of 0 equals negative 1, and I called that phi y0 equals neg 1. Um, it does give you a little warning because we are approaching places where things could blow up, especially with this one, I guess. Yeah, that's the case. Vertical asymptotes are being approached. And I can now put those things into the plots, like you see right here and right here for those other initial conditions to make a more full graph. And it does graph, okay? And here's the one where you have the, essentially the vertical asymptote. So there's the phase plane. I can also make the phase line. I can show them in a grid. And I can make a manipulate. You're showing how this gets animated as time moves on. Okay, so again, this point is a source. The points are moving away from it. This one, is about, this one is a sink, the points are moving toward it. And this one is a source, the points are moving away. I wonder if there's a way to figure out what equilibrium points are sinks and sources without even making a graph the right-hand side function or the phase line. You might wonder that. There is a way to do it. Let me mention what that way is right now, actually. And this way, this way of figuring out which equilibrium points are sinks and sources um, is essentially a theorem. I'm not going to show you the theorem statement in this lecture, probably in Lecture 10a. I will. It's called the linearization theorem. And it has to do with the slope of this function, the derivative of this function, f of y, 
at the equilibrium points. Remember here, there are three equilibrium points where this function has roots at 0, 2, and 4. The derivative at 0, the slope of the tangent there, is positive. The derivative at 2 is negative. And the derivative at 4 is positive. f prime of y is the cubic formula for f prime. Let's go ahead and differentiate it as 3y squared minus 12y plus 8. If I plug in, for example, 0 into that, I get 8, which is positive. That slope is positive. If I plug in 2 into that, I should get a negative number. Let's just do it mentally here. 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12. 12 minus 12 times 2 is 12 minus 24 is negative 12. Plus 8 is negative 4. The slope there is negative 4, negative. And the slope at 4 would be positive again. When the slope at a root is positive, the function changes sign from negative to positive, like at 0 and at 4. When the slope at a root is negative, the function is going to change sign from positive to negative. That change in sign of this function from negative to positive here, from positive to negative here, from negative to positive there, tells you that solutions change from decreasing to increasing, then to decreasing, then to increasing, and really tells you that the equilibrium points go from being a source to a sink to a source. At equilibrium points, it's important that you do this thing at equilibrium points. When you plug in the equilibrium points into the derivative of the right-hand side function, if it's positive, the equilibrium point is going to be a source. If it's negative, it's going to be a sink. That's called a linearization theorem. Taking the derivative of f, not a solution curve. I'm not differentiating one of these solution curves. I'm differentiating the right-hand side function. But it's derivative, it's sine, positive or negative, at its roots, which correspond to equilibrium points, tells you whether those equilibrium points are sinks or sources. Example three is a cubic again, but this time it's got what's called a double root. f of y is y times y minus 2 quantity squared, which can be expanded out to this. It's got two real roots, 0 and 2. And because this thing is a square, the root at 2 is a double root, a root of multiplicity 2. If you graph this function, maybe you want to pause the video and go ahead and try to graph it on your own. Are you back with me now? When you graph it, at y equals 2, it doesn't cross the axis. It just touches it. That one value of y and then bounce it back off, so to speak, it doesn't change sign. The phase line is going to have a node at 2, not a sink or a source. Here's the phase line. Yeah. When y is negative, this function has negative outputs. y prime of solution curves, dy dt of solution curves, is negative. Solution curves have negative slopes. When y is negative, so solution curves are decreasing when y is negative. Make a downward pointing arrow there. When y is between 0 and 2, this function has positive outputs. y prime, or dy dt, is positive. Slopes of solutions are positive when your initial conditions are between 0 and 2, or when any y value for such a solution curve is between 0 and 2. Solutions are increasing. 2 and 0 are equilibrium points. They correspond to equilibrium solutions in the phase plane. Phase plane. Slope field, I should call it. Excuse me, not phase plane. I'm going to reserve phase plane for two dimensional systems of equations, not single differential equations. When y is bigger than 2, solutions are increasing because this graph is positive. So this is a source, but this is a node right there. It's, in a sense, a sink from below and a source from above. There are nodes that are at the opposite, a sink from above and a source below. Okay, So this kind of thing can happen too. What would happen at a triple root? I'll remind you here that there is a slope field and the solution curves in the background, just not drawing them. Let's go ahead and look at mathematical plus as well. Here's our Q 
cubic with a double root. What does desolve value do? It does something even weirder than last time. Produces output that looks like this. Yikes. Inverse function, what's that? What, what's, the, what's this number or pound symbol doing in there? Well, you don't really need to worry about it. Essentially, inverse functions are telling you inverse functions are being used. I just copy and pasted this down here. And then I can enter this thing. Doesn't work completely. Uh, it works best, if I think I recall correctly, between when y0 is between 0 and 2. It does plot this solution when y0 is 1, although it takes a little while to plot it. I went back to using nd solve value for other initial conditions, like at 3 and negative 1. But we can still then make graphs of solutions. That's what the, the slope field looks like. Two equilibrium solutions at 0 and 2. This one's a source. Solutions here are decreasing, solutions here are increasing, so solutions are moving away, so to speak, as time increases. The state of the system moves away from zero when you start close to zero. If you want to think in terms of states of systems like pendula or something. Two is a node. Solutions with initial conditions just below increase toward two. Solutions with initial conditions just above increase away from two. What happens at a triple root? Like this. dy dt equals y cubed. Graph that function looks like this. It does cross the horizontal axis, though it does so with a zero slope. It does change sign from negative to positive, but that linearization theorem cannot be used. So what does that mean? Well, it, the fact that it changes sign from negative to positive does mean the equilibrium solution at zero for the slope field, the equilibrium point at zero for the phase line, is a source. Solutions with initial conditions above zero increase. Solutions with initial conditions below zero decrease. So this is a source. The linearization theorem could not be applied to say that, though. The derivative of the right-hand side function at its root, 0, is 0. It might look like it has a tiny positive slope there, but it actually doesn't. The slope of the tangent line at the origin there is 0, exactly. And the derivative of this is 3y squared, and its value at 0 is 3 times 0 squared, or 0. So the linearization theorem cannot be used, but the equilibrium point is a source because the right-hand side function changes sign. What does the slope field look like in example four? And what does desol value give you? Desol value actually seems to work a little bit better in this case. Not so ugly looking anymore. Although it's not doing a perfect job because it's giving us solutions that evidently would only have negative outputs. Well, it turns out when you have a positive initial condition, if you get rid of that negative sign, you get another solution. So you can define the solution in a piecewise way. And you can plot it with initial condition 1 or negative 1. Uh, by the way, in this graph over here, this is not the origin. The origin would be up here somewhere. But put the axis in there in a spot that's not the usual thing. And the, the origin is not here either for this graph. If you plot these, Along with the slope field, you get a picture that looks like this. And indeed, the equilibrium solution at zero is a source. The other solutions move away from it as t increases. However, <clears throat> notice something a little different than usual in that it appears that these solutions as t goes to minus infinity are not necessarily approaching the t-axis as a horizontal asymptote, it seems. They're getting pretty flat over here. So does that mean, that, is that true? Are they really not approaching the t-axis as a horizontal asymptote as t goes to minus infinity? That's actually false that they are not. They are actually approaching the t-axis. It's just harder to tell. 
it's just very, very slow approaching as t goes to minus infinity. What would that mean in terms of the phase line? In a sense, what that means in the phase line in our analogy about water flowing is that in this example, if you started with initial, an initial condition ever, just ever so slightly different from zero, 10 to the negative a million power or something, or okay, not so extreme, 10 to the negative two or something, 0 0.01, that solution, that point, if I animated it, would move away from zero very, very, very slowly at first. All of a sudden, once it gets close to one, it would speed up, actually. And that's related to the fact that with this graph, when you get past one, the, the slope increases pretty quickly. But when you're between negative one and one, the slope is pretty close to zero. So initial conditions near this point move away from it but very, very slowly if they start up close to the point. But again, once you get close to one or negative one, then they start moving a lot faster. That's, it's, so you would say it's kind of a weak source. It's a source, but it's a weak source. And the corresponding sink that would do something similar would be a weak sink. By the way, if the example was negative y cubed instead of positive y cubed, the graph on the right-hand side would look like this, and it would be a weak sink at the origin. Two more examples. And then, we're, uh, well, one more example of a regular phase line. Then we're going to consider the introduction of the idea of a bifurcation. Getting close to the end here. Going to go pretty quick. Um, what if the right-hand side function was not a polynomial, not a quadratic or a cubic or a quartic or a quintic or whatever? Maybe a trig function like cosine y. Hmm. That right-hand side function, if you graph it, looks like this. It oscillates, and in fact, the oscillations keep going forever and ever. Right? You know that in both the positive and negative direction. And you, you don't have just one, two, three, four intercepts. You've got infinitely many. Just not, you can't show them all. This one would be at pi over two, 90 degrees. But remember, it's really pi over two. Three pi over two, there'd be another one at five pi over two, and seven pi over two, and nine pi over two, et cetera. This is a negative pi over two, this is a negative three pi over two, then negative five pi over two, then negative seven pi over two, then negative nine pi over two, et cetera. There are infinitely many roots of this function. There are therefore infinitely many equilibrium points on the phase line and infinitely many equilibrium solutions in the slope field. Ones where the slope here is positive, like here and here, are going to be sources. Ones where the slope of the right-hand side function is negative, at the, the intercepts here, like here and here, are going to get corresponding equilibrium points that are sinks. And here's a basic picture. So there's a sink at negative 3 pi over 2 at positive pi over 2, corresponding to this point here and this point here. There are sources at negative pi over 2 and positive 3 pi over 2, corresponding to this point here and this point there. And it keeps going back and forth between sinks and sources forever and ever, in both as you go upwards and downwards. What happens with Mathematica here? Well, the uh, differential equation is harder to solve. It seems it would be at least, though desolved value does produce an answer. Two arctangent of tench. What's that? Hyperbolic tangent. Have you ever heard of hyperbolic tangent before? And arctanch. Inverse hyperbolic tangent and tangent. Yikes. That does work, though it seems to only work best between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, it turns out. You might try imagining solving this differential equation by hand, by separation of variables. You'd have to integrate 1 over cosine, and you get that kind of thing. So it would be hard to solve for y. But evidently, it's somewhat possible, at least. And we can use an ND solve value in a few different places here and get numerical approximations. And here is the slope field with some solution curves, including equilibrium uh, solutions and non equilibrium solutions. So it can be done, but it's, it's a bit harder. Okay?
once again, we should remember that there is a slope field in the background. Don't ever forget that when you think about these equilibrium, or when you think about these phase lines here. All right, here's our last example to introduce the idea of a bifurcation. We're going to look at what's called a family of autonomous ODEs and phase lines. And I'm, only, I'm not going to show you pictures that are made with Mathematica. I'm only going to draw some by hand here. That's, that's good. You should be able to draw them by hand as well. Consider the one parameter, parameter family of autonomous ODEs. What in the world is that? It's something like this. The dt equals f sub mu of y equals y squared plus mu. Hmm. Mu is a pretty cool Greek letter. It's spelled M-U, and that's great because it kind of looks like an M and it kind of looks like a U. Mu, hey. What is it? T is the independent variable just as always. Y is the dependent variable just as always. So what's mu? It's, it's a parameter. Does that mean it has to do with parametric equations? Not really. It's, the word parameter has many different meanings. Here essentially it means something oxymoronic. It means a constant that can vary. Huh? How can a constant vary? Well, it's just all in your mind. It's all in how you think about it. When I, I think about a fixed value of mu, then I've got a single differential equation. But different values of mu will produce different differential equations that are all kind of similar to each other. Maybe their solutions, maybe their phase lines are similar to each other. What might be interesting is to see if any changes happen in the phase line as mu itself changes, and that is the goal. When such a change happens, it's typically called a bifurcation. There's a good reason for that, that strange word, bifurcation. It's related to the fact that some pictures we're going to draw kind of look like a pitchfork with two curves moving out from it. Bifurcate. I don't know if that's the best description of it. It doesn't always happen that way. Some of these pictures that we're going to draw, I'm not saying what the pictures are yet. That will come in lecture 10a. What we want to do is we want to draw the phase line for various values of the parameter. And I'll just do this on the smart board. Though I did make an animation in Mathematica, I think, if I recall correctly. So what do we need to do? Think about the graph of the right-hand side function. As a function of y, four different values of mu. And I made it a pretty simple example. y squared plus mu is a parabola opening upward with a vertex actually on the vertical axis here. If mu is positive, it's not going to have any horizontal intercepts. This is the graph when mu is positive. When mu is 0, it'd be the graph of y squared. It's just going to touch the horizontal axis at y equals 0. It's going to be, and these are all vertical translations of each other. I'm not drawing it perfectly. But they are all vertical translations of each other. And then finally, when mu is negative, y squared plus mu is really like y squared minus something, minus 3 or something. You're going to have two y intercepts two horizontal axis intercepts are going to be down here. The vertical intercept is going to be negative. When becomes negative. Thinking about the corresponding phase lines then, if mu is positive, the right hand side function is always positive. Solutions always have positive slopes. There are no equilibrium solutions. All solutions are increasing. So you get a picture with a bunch of arrows going upward and no equilibrium points. When mu is 0, you just touch the axis of the origin there. There's one equilibrium point at mu equals 0, or excuse me, y equals 0. It's a y there. And it's a node. Finally, when mu is less than 0, You've got two equilibrium points. And if you think about the signs, positive, negative, then positive again, of the right-hand side function, you get solutions that increase down here, sorry, decrease, increase. This one's a source. 
and this one is a sink. So a big change in the phase that happens as mu increases through zero, at zero something special happens, a bifurcation occurs, big change. Let's end this lecture by looking at an animation of this that I made with manipulate and this right hand side function. Notice I did need to put the mu in the subscript here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And I actually needed to use D cell value three different times based on different assumptions to get different formulas. I'm actually not going to use this formula, but just for your benefit there. Here I made the slope field, not a, not a uh, phase line that we can look at along with equilibrium solutions as mu increases. We can see how the slope field changes and how the equilibrium solutions merge together and annihilate each other in a sense. Okay. That's pretty interesting, I think. This is one, why it's one of my favorite things. And it gets even more interesting in the higher dimensions. That's the end of Lecture 9A. Thanks for watching.